fellow Ugandans, wherever you're watching or listening from, those in the villages, those in towns and cities, and those in the diaspora, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Today, I would like to talk to you about the state of our nation and how it is affecting all of us, most especially the ordinary people. On behalf of the leadership of the National Unity Platform, I salute you, ladies and gentlemen, all of you, our people, who have trusted us to speak and act on your behalf on public policy matters. Our population is estimated to be about 42 million people and is growing at an average of 3% every year. Uganda's population is expanding much faster than most countries at Uganda's development level. So I'm speaking to you, ladies and gentlemen, at a time when our fast-growing population is facing fast-rising prices of almost everything with clearly no hope of any kind of relief from the state. I am aware, ladies and gentlemen, of the lost hope and of the shattered livelihoods which is caused by the high, by the high cost of living. 2022 is probably the worst year for salary earners and for farmers whose produce must be transported by trucks running on diesel. Transport for the people, especially public means, is slowing down as the transport costs are rising. At the same time, the presidency, which is state house and president's office, have already spent 971 billion, almost a trillion shillings. Yes, 971 billion shillings. Now, about the rising cost of living. On the 22nd of May, General Museveni addressed the nation about the rising cost of living. He, however, did not offer any kind of relief or solution to the citizens, but instead he advised Ugandans to tighten their seat belts. Well, on his part, he continues to spend public money as if he's not aware that the country is suffering a price shock. Between November 2021 and April 2022, prices of household commodities increased to levels which, which are way, way beyond the reach of the ordinary citizens. This information is on the Uganda Bureau of Statistics website, the UBOS website, and it's available for all of you to see. Therefore, fellow Ugandans, for us to arrest this situation, government must go back to the fuel market. And yes, government must do the following things. Number one, government must impose control on stocking levels and pricing decisions. I mean, no responsible government continues to just cry and lament on forces of demand and supply when the Petroleum Supplies Act allows the government to do something. We think government, through the Commissioner of Petroleum Supplies, which is actually the legal licensing authority, should split the average cost of every liter of fuel into three categories and go ahead to publicize them for the consumer and ordinary person to understand and appreciate the changes that are happening. First, the unit cost of delivering a liter of fuel from wherever it's coming from to the borders of Uganda. Secondly, the tax per unit. And third, the margin, the, the margin of profit per unit. Now, every liter of fuel, whether petrol or diesel, has a unit cost. A cost of bringing it to the border. It could be Malaba, it could be Busia or Mutukula. For example, a liter is brought from the refineries in the Middle East 
up to Busia at a cost of, uh, for example, 2,800 shillings. And this is the first level of costing. Now, the second level is tax. So you add the tax on that 2,800, which, I mean, is brought on our borders. The third category is the profit margin. Now, this is where everything goes wrong. The fuel companies are setting a higher profit margin while the consumer has generally accepted to be exploited. I mean, the companies are setting whatever prices they want while the regulator is quiet. This is not a mistake, ladies and gentlemen, because the same people who are supposed to regulate are actually the same people in the fuel business. So they cannot regulate themselves. They also do not break down and publicize all these details in transparency for you the common person to understand because they want to exploit you in ignorance number two we think the government must abolish fuel marking because this is a useless exercise which was only useful in the years before customs computerized cargo tracking but today it only holds and delays trucks at the border for nothing and number three and most urgent and important of all is government must suspend taxes on crude vegetable oil and wheat. This will help to reduce the prices of essential items like chapati. The ghetto people in our cities, in the towns and the trading center, the centers largely survive mainly on chapati, which also makes chikomando and makes Rolex. And this policy, this policy decision is very urgent and indeed long overdue. Let's forget about this business of Museveni coming to tell us to eat cassava if we can't afford bread. I mean, cassava or cassava flour cannot make chapati. It cannot make chikomando. Therefore, it cannot make Rolex. But that goes ahead to just show how disconnected Museveni is from the people. Now, you're going to ask me how do we deal with the revenue lost by removing tax from vegetable oil and wheat? My answer is simple. Cut the classified expenditure in order to accommodate the revenue loss created by a tax exemption on the cooking oil and wheat. Simple. Now, about the failure of government to deliver public services. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Ugandans, the NRM government has failed twice. It failed to raise enough revenue to support the fast-growing population, and it has also failed. I mean, it has outrightly stolen and unfairly distributed the little revenue that is collected. The NRM party, because of selective application of tax policy and administration, the, tax, the taxes collected are not matching the reported size of the economy. The economy is expanding to higher levels, while the few people that are taxed are taxed exorbitantly at high tax rates. Now, this is a comparison of Uganda's average revenue expenditure as per GDP with other countries in our league between 2016 and 2020. Uganda has revenue collected as a percentage of GDP. The revenue collected is 13.1. And total expenditure as of percentage of GDP is 17.4. Rwanda has total revenue uh, collected of 23.2. Total spending is 27.5 Kenya revenue collected 17.4 total spending 24.8 Senegal revenue collected 19.9 total spending 23.9 Zambia collected 19.2 spent 28.1 now this is information coming from the International Monetary Fund the economic outlook database of April 2022. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Uganda has been held hostage by an old man who has no idea whatsoever how to grow domestic revenue without increasing tax rates. Kwegamba Museveni has no idea whatsoever on how to make everyone who earns income pay an equal and proportional share of their income tax. Uganda, on average, between 2016 and 2020, collected 13.1% as of GDP on tax and spent 17.4% of it in total government expenditure. On the other hand, Kenya, Senegal, Zambia, and yes, Rwanda, on average, collected above 20% and spent a little more, almost 30%. So this means that these governments have higher capacity to spend on public goods and services for their citizens according to the sizes of their, of their revenue and their expenditure when compared to the sizes of their economies. These countries have better health care, they have better education, and yes, life is better there. And now the other tragedy is that even the little, the 12% GDP that is collected is eaten by the dictator and his cronies. A case in point is the current financial year, 2021-2022. The presidency, state house and the office of the president has already taken 971 billion 504 million shillings. One of the biggest expenditures in the financial year 2021-2022. And after spending all that money on himself, Museven is advising people to tighten their seat belts because the prices are going high. During the same financial year 2021-2022, 200 billion has been released for just the preparatory activities of the parish development model. The total amount to be released for the parish model is supposed to be 1 trillion shillings. So what State House is spent is almost the same as the parish development model. So the presidency and the parish model are competing and we all know who will be the winner at the end of the day. Of course, the presidency will spend more money than the parish model. So far, it is 971 billion for the presidency and 200 billion for the parish model, and the race is on. When I'm in power, ladies and gentlemen, my wife, my children, and I do not need to spend 1 trillion shillings maintaining our presidency. I mean, we will be like we should be like all the presidents that have come before Museveni, who only budgeted for the office of the president, including state house. I mean, excluding state house. State house, ladies and gentlemen, is just a residence. We should be able to cater for the needs of its occupants, besides the guards who are paid by the Minister of Defense. I mean, a president earns a salary, and that should be enough to take care of his family. Therefore, fellow Ugandans, remember that by removing that extravagant family from our state house, we shall save over 800 billion, including the annual supplementary budgets from state house alone. That is the much we can save just by removing the dictator. Now, about agriculture, and in particular, coffee. I would like to address the issue of adding value to Uganda's golden bean. And by bean, I mean the coffee bean. Ever since our shadow minister of agriculture, Honorable Abed Wanika, revealed a secret agreement between government of Uganda and the coffee company called Vinci, which is also connected to the fake Lubowa Hospital project, a lot has been established. There's no doubt that establishment of a soluble coffee factory that produces instant coffee like Nescafe is a great achievement. The National Development Plan supports the establishment of such a factory. In fact, 
every Ugandan should be in support of establishing such a factory because one, it improves the value of some of our country's low-grade coffee beans. Number two, it raises Uganda's competitiveness in the region as a producer and exporter of instant coffee. And number three, it ensures that only premium coffee beans are exported to high-end markets like Starbucks coffee where the price per kilo is much, much, much higher. So it's a benefit for our people. Unfortunately, in the deal between government of Uganda and Vinci Coffee Company, our country stood to lose instead of gaining. And this is because of the following reasons. Reason number one. The factory was not targeting to add value to the low-grade beans. Instead, the agreement ring-fenced the high-value beans usually reserved for brewed coffee, not soluble instant coffee. Now, this means that Vinci, instead of exporting high-value beans unprocessed by giving all premium beans to Vinci, a monopoly over this cream coffee was created. And this led to directly knocking out other exporters from the business of exporting coffee beans. And this does not make economic sense because premium beans are given only to one company and in effect all the current exporters of coffee would eventually be kicked out of business. Number two, globally instant coffee is produced from low value coffee beans while brewed coffee is made from the large premium roasted beans. Now in the agreement which parliament has since moved to terminate, Vinci is seen prioritizing beans made for brewed coffee, not instant coffee, which the factory ordinarily meant to produce. There is no single benefit, ladies and gentlemen, and this is one important reason. There is no single benefit that the country would gain from this deal. Yes, coffee export revenues would rise, and that is only on paper, but not in the banks of Uganda. The owners of Vinci have no tax obligations whatsoever. So it makes business sense for Pinetti and her colleagues to basically take away all the revenue for at least 10 years while the same, at the same time they are receiving subsidies like electricity charges which is below even the cost price. Number four, Vinci came to Uganda with nothing. The fact that they were given land to establish a factory by government, Vinci, the so-called rich investor, applied for authority to use the same land to acquire a loan and in the typical NRM mafia style, the application was approved by Uganda Investment Authority. And without shame, the Minister of Finance confirmed to Parliament that he signed the agreement without seeing the feasibility study, without a market survey report, or even proof of funding. So in summary, this is just another briefcase investor who is being used by the Museveni Mafia government to do another Lubowa hospital kind of fraud. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, as NUP, we support the establishment of a soluble coffee factory. But a factory that targets adding value to some of our low-value coffee beans, which also brings us profits when we export them. The Uganda Coffee Development Authority should continue supplying coffee seedlings to farmers across the country because you know what? Emwanyi Terimba. In conclusion, fellow Ugandans, today I have just briefly highlighted on some of our pressing issues and how we can deal with them. But I would like to remind you that the dictator is desperately you know, trying to use all means to hold on to power. He has designed his system to make every one of us a beggar, struggling not to, make, not to live better lives. 
but just for survival. It is therefore the duty of every Ugandan to do whatever you can in your ability to remove the dictator. We intend to continue giving facts to the nation so that all citizens of Uganda can understand and appreciate why we must change the situation and change it very soon. Today, we have picked just a few areas for your information and reflection. And in the coming days, we shall address you, especially on health care, on education, on job creation, on infrastructure, and importantly, on the changing climate. As of now, I thank you very much for listening to me, ladies and gentlemen, for God and my country. People power, our power. Our power, people power. It was 9th of October 1962 when the nation was born. Beautiful and endowed with the promise of democracy. With unity and diversity, all on a mission to build a nation that would make life better for the future generations. Well, indeed, we are that generation. The grandchildren of the independence generation. And oh, yes, the grandparents of the future generations. We must within ourselves find solutions. Since our leaders don't seem to care for the next generation, but instead care for the next general election. Chan, chan. But we